So good afternoon again, colleagues. We will be starting in just a minute. I would invite you, if you wish, to turn your cameras on so our audience can see you there. But obviously, please stay in mute uh, unless uh, you're speaking. Uh, and we do want to hear from you all. So please do uh, try to stick the time in your opening remarks. But then when we go into the discussion, uh, very happy to hear from many of you. So once we open up to Q&A, if you want to just signal you'd like to come in on a point or, or even ask another panelist a question, you'd be very welcome to do that. We'll make this as interactive as possible. And I know that we're going to learn a lot from all of you today, and I'm sure all of our audience will. So we're very grateful. So I'm just going to go silent for 20 seconds while Matthew lets all of our uh, viewers in, and then we'll start straight away. So thanks again for joining us. We appreciate it. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are. This is Brian Motherway here at the International Energy Agency, welcoming you all today to a webinar on a very important topic uh, where we have many eminent and knowledgeable speakers to discuss with us about skills development for clean energy transitions in the MENA region. We know that, that employment and benefiting people through new, well-paid, good quality jobs is a central part of clean energy transitions around the world and, and very much so in the MENA region where there are so many opportunities in terms of resources, skills, bases, uh, and new emerging opportunities across all types of clean energy. But of course, it takes preparation and many governments are already moving in terms of preparing skills programs, getting their workforces ready, uh, existing and future for the opportunities that will emerge. And so we're here today to discuss some of the opportunities as well as the challenges related to this topic uh, in the region. I'm delighted that so many people are joining us, including our speakers, but also all of you who are joining us online, you're very welcome. And you're also very welcome to participate. So please feel free to, to enter a question or comment in the chat box below. And we'll certainly take as many questions as, as time allows during the next uh, 90 minutes. So we're very pleased you're all with us today. Let me turn now to my colleague, uh, Nadim Abilama, who's uh, my colleague here at the IEA, our MENA Energy Analyst and Program Officer. He's going to kindly give us some opening remarks here today. Nadim, thank you for your collaboration on this event and the floor is now yours. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, for making that introduction. And, uh, and uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, being here, both speakers and uh, participants. So I'm uh, Nadim Abilama. I'm the Middle East and North Africa Program Officer here at the IEA. So the MENA program focuses on basically the intersection between uh, economic development and the energy sector, and especially in uh, the changing or the evolving um, global energy systems. Uh, we can see that, especially for the MENA region, there is a shift um, a, or a gradual shift towards a revenue model uh, in the region as, as key energy consumers across the world are, are um, accelerating their energy transitions. Hence, MENA producer will uh, gradually also shift their their um, their economic models. We can see from the ambitious diversification, economic diversification programs in the region that this is uh, already happening, but uh, these changes will be underpinned by some deep and profound labor market transformations that include also a higher role for the, um, for the private sector, uh, but also a higher role for, for example, enabling the participation of women or other actors that were 
potentially less involved in labor markets before. Um, and as these economies diversify, so do uh, the energy sectors. Uh, in order to reduce dependence on oil and gas exports, producers will have to gradually shift their new revenue models in favor of clean energy technologies. And for that, you need the uh, adequate skills to be able to staff uh, uh, the future positions that would make <clears throat> this model work. So this is why we're all here today. And uh, also this is why we, we are happy to have a wide representation within the region. And we would be really pleased to hear your views and your perspectives on, on this very important matter. So I hope you enjoy the workshop. And uh, as uh, Brian uh, mentioned before, don't hesitate to interact directly with the panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nadim, and thank you for setting the scene and the strategic context in which we're discussing today. And let's also now just briefly set the scene in analytic terms, and, and we're going to hear about some of the IEA's work looking at uh, employment and skills in, in energy and in clean energy particularly. And for that, we're joined uh, by Bruno Adini, an analyst here at the IEA. Bruno, thanks for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I think uh, maybe Matthew will share my, my slides. Yeah, it's great. Thank you very much. Uh, so let me extend the welcome that um, uh, from Nadim as well, just to, to all the stakeholders from the region today. Uh, so my name is Bruno Edini. I work within the World Energy Outlook team, uh, now specifically on energy employment, which is a work that we first launched last year and now uh, will become a yearly publication that will be updated um, later this fall. If you could kindly uh, move to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, so first, let me set the scene like with kind of a global perspective. Uh, so today, most of the uh, most of our energy jobs are concentrated in the Asia Pacific region, with the China alone accounting for around one third of total employment. Now, the reason why there is such a high concentration in this region of jobs is first of all because of new new infrastructure projects that are coming online, but also because of the high share of manufacturing jobs that uh, that the region has, which we also model. For, for manufacturing that is related to the energy uh, to the energy sector. As you can see in the pie charts, the green um, the, the green part which shows clean energy um, showcases that most regions today already have surpassed that 50% mark of, uh, of total energy jobs related to clean energy. Now the Middle East stands out as, a, as an important exception to this, but globally in the base year that we use for the for the past publication, which was 2019, clean energy jobs were already over 50% of total employment in the energy sector. If you can move to the next slide um, and just skip twice, please. Thanks. Um, so this is very important talking about skills because um, it shows that energy employment, the energy sector requires a higher level of skills compared to the, to the broader economy. So what we identify here is that 45% of all energy jobs require whether a university degree of some type of vocational training that we classify as, uh, as high skill. And then there is a, a, a much smaller share compared to the, to the broader economy, which is somewhere around 5%, which is low skill labor, which is mainly, uh, main, mainly concentrated in emerging markets and developing economies. And this is because not only there is much more manual labor in those regions, but also because you have, uh, well, much less uh, mechan mechanization of production processes. And uh, the focus that we have on skills and also uh, the, the, which is the, the main topic of today's session is mainly for two reasons. The first one is that higher skills will bring higher job quality for workers, especially in terms of wage premiums compared to non-energy jobs. And therefore the skill distribution within the energy value chain can help workers navigate the different career opportunities that they will have so there is this qualitative element first. The second one is more structural, and it has to do with the fact that with growing demand for energy workers, the energy transition will require more skilled, a more skilled labor force. And we see that mapping these skills, uh, especially particularly the gaps, can help energy companies foreseeing potential hiring difficulties. If uh, we can move to the next slide, please. And just skip once, uh, thanks. Uh, so just briefly, the clean energy transition is transforming the energy employment landscape. And this is not happening overnight, but if we were to expect all governments that have put in climate pledges to reach those pledges in full, we would expect that the global market for some of the key clean energy technologies to reach 650 billion 
dollars per year to 2030, which is around three times more than today. Now, those key, uh, some of those um, key clean technologies are solar PV, batteries, wind systems, uh, and heat pumps, among others. Um, but the sort of the IA's work also, a lot of the emphasis that we're having here is to put, um, to contribute in, in shaping the energy transition in a people-centered way. And uh, we believe, as, as you can see here in the screen, that mapping the energy employment trends will promote, first of all, um, the, the, use, uh, the use of information on the skill needs for the sector, inform how to facilitate the career transitions from fossil fuels into the clean energy sectors, and lastly, emphasizing the need to focus not only on job quality, but also on inclusivity within the energy sector. And I will just close now, if you can just keep one more, thanks, just with some of the future scopes in terms of how we want to extend our work, we'll be first looking at occupations across the energy sector and potential overlaps with the broader economy, mapping the skills that are common across similar occupations, but let's say between fossil fuels and the clean energy, and the clean energy sector, or clean energy sector and the broader economy. Third, the wages of those occupations. So when we talk about skill transferability, yes, there, there might be an opportunity there, but also there needs to be like, a, I mean, wages need to make sense for workers um, in, ter to, uh, in order to be attracted to the, to, the, to the energy sector, particularly to clean energy jobs. Uh, fourth, vacancies, um, being able to potentially address hiring gaps that we could identify. And lastly, we want to expand our work on critical, critical minerals, not only mining, but also in processing. And with that, I hope I just gave you a, a good sense of, of the, the, to set the scene. Uh, thank you very, very much, Brian. Over to you. Thank you, Bruno. And indeed, you did set the scene very well. You gave us a very good overview, and I think it does really help frame the discussion. It, it gives us a sense of the opportunity, but also the key issues that we're going to hear many perspectives on now directly from the region. And let's go straight to that. And our first intervention comes from Jordan, from Faiza Asaf, who is the project officer at Adama Association for Energy, Water and Environment in Jordan. So Faiza, we're delighted you're with us today, and I now hand the floor to you. Uh, thank you, Brian. Thank you, everyone, for giving me the opportunity to speak in this uh, amazing workshop. Uh, I'm going to briefly talk about Idama and how we are, are playing a role in the uh, uh, energy sector. Uh, oh, so, I, do I have the um, sorry? Do I have the, the the request to 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 play the the next? Uh, I don't know what uh, slide. Maybe J just call out next slide, Faiza. We'll do yeah, it. Yeah. Okay. You. Next slide, please. So our main mission is to um, uh, make sure that uh, Jordan uh, green economy uh, is built and it's um, uh, uh, empowered with leadership and business. So next slide, please. Uh, so uh, Idama means sustainability in Arabic to uh, whoever whoever know, knows Arabic. Idama means sustainability. Uh, it, uh, Idama is an NGO that started in uh, 2009, and we are currently uh, have the different pillars uh, pillars to to um, let's say start uh, the presentation. So may please next slide. Our main pillars are capacity building policy advocacy, business development, and public awareness and CSR. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, regarding the capacity building, which is the main uh, focus on this, let's say, this workshop, uh, IDAMA has been um, uh, in different trainings and workshops throughout the years uh, with different projects that also build the capacity uh, to different uh, youth and trainees around Jordan and internationally, of course. So next slide, please. Uh, one of our projects was uh, with NOFIC. Uh, it was to help the Syrian refugees and youth uh, uh, in the um, energy sector. Uh, so it was about cleaning the PV cells. Uh, we trained the 45 youth uh, from, the, from the refugees camps. Uh, after that, we, uh, uh, we um, created them a jobs to, um, to help them start their own business. Uh, with the renewable energy sector. Next slide, please. Uh, other project that we currently have is DAO with uh, Yellow Door Energy and Actis. 
which is also to uh, certify 20 trainees from the uh, um, ca uh, free ca camps, um, let's say the refugees camps, to build their um, own business as well, or to be certified to build uh, PV sales models uh, and install and maintenance uh, for the training itself. Next slide, please. We also have a project with BDC and uh, EU for delegation in Jordan, which is about three trainings uh, that will be held in Al Azra camp. Uh, it will be mainly about the uh, solar PV modules, cleaning, housekeeping uh, for 100 uh, youth uh, who is under uh, 25, and for this solid waste management for around uh, 40 people, and for organic farming, which is also for around 40 people. Uh, for uh, the unvulnerable, um, uh, let's say, uh, tra trainees from the refugees. Oops. So next slide, slide, please. We also have a project for solid waste management in Aqaba that may, uh, that's about the pilot of the composting. Uh, we started with training 38 uh, youth who's also uh, underserved. And now there are eight uh, working in the pilot site uh, as of today. Uh, and that's it. Thank you and for the opportunity again. And this is uh, what we are doing uh, currently in Idama. Thank you very much, Faisi. It's really great to hear that. And, and congratulations on that excellent work, those projects. I think I uh, can be an example to many in terms of what you're achieving with the focus on on creating jobs and creating skills in the clean energy sector, but also targeting vulnerable people to give them those opportunities. So thank you. I'm sure we'll come back to some parts of that in our discussion in just a little while. So thank you. Let's go next now, though, to Rind Alhage. Rind, we're delighted you're with us. Rind is a monitoring and evaluation and learning lead at the uh, Sustainable Development Goal 7 Youth Constituency. Rind, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hi, thanks, everyone. I'm here from the SDG 7 Youth Constituency, which is a network of young people that are interested in clean and sustainable energy. What happened, uh, what's happening right now is that we're holding the biggest climate conferences in one of the most fossil producing regions in the world. So it's a mix, is it a mix of irony, greenwashing, or is it a sign of real change? This question is becoming more and more relevant, especially for people like me, the youth of MENA, when we consider the challenges that we still have on skill development for the clean energy transition in this area where youth make up more than half of the region's population. So there are many challenges. First of all, when it comes to the classic training programs like university curricula on energy, they are often either outdated or mismatched with what the actual needs of the job market. So while most programs might be very good and up to date on the technical side of sustainable energy, they often overlook these soft skills like project management and negotiation that we need for the clean energy sector. On the other hand, we have these more experienced professionals in fossil fuels that have these soft skills, but they don't have those very high skilled, uh, high technical skills that we talked about in the previous presentations. So we see that there is a clear way that we could actually create synergies and exchange knowledge and skills between these two groups, between the youth who have the technical skills and the older fossil generations who, who, who have the operational skills that are needed for the energy transition. And this is something that has happened. And uh, for example, for the European wind industry that made shared training programs for reskilling with youth and uh, also old coal, profession coal professionals. So I think in uh, organizations like IDAMA, we could clearly see an opportunity to have similar programs, but targeted for the region. Uh, a second issue that we also talked about, especially in, in Nadine's intervention, was that the renewable energy sector is by definition gonna change uh, the, the whole energy sphere because renewables are more decentralized than fossils. So there's more emergence of actors in the private sector uh, since it's way more decentralized and local. 
than fossil. So also when we talk about renewables, we know that this creates a possibility to have more startups and more of these local projects. But on the other hand, one of the top priorities uh, of youth and top concerns for youth in, in this region is that these entrepreneurs that are launching into sustainable energy aren't feeling that they're getting enough support from the public and private sector because the public and private sector still sees energy as the sector of big groups and big public energy utilities. So a third topic that we haven't touched upon yet is that youth in MENA don't have a lot of trust in their governments because of corruption, because of staggering inequality and the lack of inclusiveness that Bruno mentioned. So we've seen that the fossil industry in the MENA region has benefited only a handful of elites. And as the clean energy transition is bringing new opportunities, there are still some contradictions and doubts about especially longevity. For example, in green hydrogen, which is something I'm, I'm personally a bit knowledgeable about, the green hydrogen sector is quite promising since we have a lot of strong solar resources, but we're also facing severe water stress. So that's another resource constraint that I don't feel like we're taking that much into account. And we're also quite frustrated by the small role that's given to research as opposed to the business side in the energy sector. So if we continue on the same example on hydrogen, um, do we really, again, want to be in the situation where other countries sell us their technologies to produce energy from our resources in our region, and then we sell them back to them? I mean, applying this good uh, everybody knows that applying a technology is good, we can have a successful business, but if you want to think in longevity, if you want to think in the long term, we can also be inventors. Sustainability is about building the entire clean energy value chain from R&D to end use, and switching to clean energy could be an opportunity to finally redistribute and improve the livelihoods of all the mean citizens in a more equal way. And finally, let's not forget that uh, the MENA region is quite heterogeneous. So we have the very uh, resource-rich fossil labeled countries, but we also have other countries like mine, Lebanon, that still struggle with access to reliable energy. So anyone who's been in Lebanon recently has seen that solar panels are really popping up everywhere through personal initiatives and local initiatives, despite the economic crisis. Uh, I guess my intervention was a bit dark, but I think that the bigger the problem, the bigger the change, the positive change it can generate. So I and hopefully all youth in MENA are quite optimistic about the sustainable energy transition. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rind, and thank you for ending on a note of optimism while also exploring some of the complex issues that governments and, and citizens and societies have to address in these transitions. So I think, again, raise a number of issues that I'm sure will come up again during the discussion. So thank you. Let's go now to Sean Ratka. Sean, thank you for joining us. Sean is the Economic Affairs Officer in the Sustainable Energy Section of UNESCO. Sean, we're very pleased you're with us. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Uh, and just to echo uh, some of Rin's points, speaking of darkness, I'm also based in Lebanon, so if the lights go out at any point, uh, don't worry, I'll, I'll be back. Um, uh, we're currently holding, I just want to mention our Arab uh, Forum for Sustainable Development, so I'm just jumping between sessions, but if there are any questions regarding the overview that I give today, uh, my email's on the last slide, and I'd be happy to connect you with any of the experts who are managing uh, certain aspects of our skills development programs. Uh, one quick thing I'll mention about our session this morning uh, as part of the forum, it was on resilient recovery using renewables, uh, and one thing participants and donor organizations and governments and UN bodies consistently highlighted was the importance of capacity building and community engagement in order to determine the most appropriate generation technologies and to ensure local buy-in, which is the foundation for long-term sustainability of projects. So partnerships are also needed to ensure an integrated approach uh, that is just and inclusive. Uh, and this really includes vocational training focused on women and youth that goes beyond access. And those were some of the main takeaways from this morning. And I think it echoes uh, what Rind was also mentioning. So next slide, please. Uh, so in terms of energy, ESQUA has several tracks of work, including sustainable energy systems, uh, energy efficiency, renewables, and climate change mitigation. Uh, next slide, please. 
So is the Arab region on track? Uh, the short answer is no, but, but over the next five years, we foresee solid progress on renewables uh, based on data from IEA, also World Bank, uh, with renewable electricity capacity expansion in the region expected to triple uh, from 2022 to 2027 compared with the previous five-year period, reaching 45 gigawatts. And that's due in part to some of what was just discussed, uh, mainly the economic advantages here when it comes to utility-scale solar, which we've seen in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the UAE with, with very, very low uh, record-breaking auction prices. Uh, but the point I want to highlight here is that the lack of access to sustainable modern energy is a form, an outcome, and a cause of poverty. So it constrains human capabilities, uh, productivity, access to basic services, including health and education, and reinforces the lack of income generating capacity and economic opportunities. So within this context, uh, in my presentation, I'll touch on renewables and access and the work that ESQA is doing to address these gaps. Next slide, please. So one of the main questions this session aims to address is this, how can governments and related stakeholders work together to design inclusive training programs for jobs in clean energy industries? And I'd like to spend the rest of my time talking about what ESCO is doing when it comes to addressing the rural energy access gap and how we can use capacity building and training to make progress on this target as part of SDG 7. Next slide, please. So in order to address this issue of rural access, ESQUA has developed Regent, the re uh, Regional Initiative for Promoting Small-Scale Renewable Energy Applications in Rural Areas of the Arab Region. Uh, these are just a few of our latest reports, and they're all available on our website, uh, which you'll see on the next slide. Uh, next slide, please. So as part of Region, uh, ESQUA held 30 field projects in these three countries. Uh, and ESQUA was the implementing body in Lebanon and Tunisia, and our partner was the implementer in Jordan. And I think the key here is that beneficiaries uh, use this new access uh, to distributed energy resources for productive uses, including solar, water, heating, and pumping. So this reduced their uh, OPEX by about 50% in many cases. Um, we made sure that extended warranties were included so that the installer has to check every six months that everything is working properly. Uh, and they are available for two years after the project is complete to handle any maintenance issues at no cost to the beneficiaries. Uh, beneficiaries were also provided with basic training on the equipment so they know when to call for maintenance um, and when they can simply handle small issues themselves. Uh, so given the limit of time I have, I'm going to go through this swiftly, but again, all of this information is available on our website if you want more detail. Uh, next slide, please. So in the team's work in the field, uh, a lack of skills, uh, previous slide, I think. Yeah, so in the team's work in the field, a lack of skills and financing were identified as the two main barriers to implementation. And to address this region to held capacity building workshops. So an assessment report was first conducted to identify the needs of local communities. Uh, local consultants were hired to teach certain skills. And I should highlight that uh, community engagement is really key here. So what do these communities really need? Um, and local buy-in to these solutions uh, in order to guarantee the longevity of projects is key uh, and sustainable business models are needed. So what ESQA did was identified certain income generating activities with the help of the assessment reports and the consultants. And the important thing to note is that besides training on how to use and maintain the physical assets, uh, capacity building workshops were held, which covered a range of topics on how to use this new access to modern renewable energy to actually generate income. And this included embroidery, agricultural practices, food manufacturing, and financial management. Next slide, please. So going beyond access to productive use is key uh, in order to ensure these access initiatives are economically sustainable. And in this graph, you can see we focused on capacity building for women in specific to have the biggest impact, holding workshops on good food packaging practices, uh, agricultural practices, and others. And this is just one of the examples from one of the countries. Uh, next slide, please. So using the knowledge we've acquired in the field, we're now expanding beyond the original three countries and implementing these lessons learned in Algeria in order to build capacities among rural women there. Uh, the focus will be on good agricultural and food practices based on the sustainable use of natural resources to uh, handle these, these uh, issues that you see, fruit trees and palms, oil extraction, uh, processing, and, and marketing. Uh, and last slide, please. Uh, so in terms of reaching an even wider audience, a new e-learning course based on regions capacity building is now live on ESQA's website and you can access it via this QR code you see on the screen. Target audiences include women uh, and youth, local authorities, rural workers, policymakers, and researchers in national uh, and regional agencies. Um, I have a few more points on youth and things like that, but let's save it for the discussion. And Machia was very strict with me with uh, keeping to my time. So I'll end there and uh, allow the time for the other participants. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Sean. That's really great. You're able to stay with us for a little while, are you? Yes, yes, no problem. Great, good. I'm sure we'll have questions for you. So I really appreciate that. Really interesting to see, to see the range of that work. So congratulations. Let's go less, Lex now to Iraq, and we're joined by Noam Redan, energy consultant in Iraq. In Iraq. Noam, we're delighted you're with us. The floor is, with, is yours now. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I will need the team's help with the slides, uh, please. Um, first of all, thank you for having me here. I will keep my presentation short and to the point. Uh, some numbers I will be sharing today were first published in a research paper I contributed to last year and which was led by energy expert Harris Tipanyan. The paper for those interested is titled A Roadmap to Prepare Iraq's Power Sector for Energy Transition, which was published by the Baghdad-based Al Bayan Center. I will, uh, I will start with uh, slide two, please. Uh, this is a quick summary of key numbers and facts uh, in Iraq's energy sector, oil, gas, and electricity. The first figure you see on this slide is 4.5 million barrels per day. This is federal Iraq's crude production as of December 2022. Iraq wants to boost capacity to 5 million barrels per day and even 8 million barrels per day in the next few years, despite some challenges. Iraq, OPEC's second biggest oil producer after Saudi Arabia, heavily relies on crude oil sales for revenues. More than 90% of Baghdad's state budget comes from crude sales. And according to estimates, the federal government needs more than $4 billion each month for public salaries and pensions. Just last month, February, such sales generated around $7 billion for Iraq. Moving to the second figure, 43%. Iraq has the 12th largest gas reserves in the world. However, federal Iraq produces, we're talking here domestic production, only 43% of natural gas for domestic use. The third figure is 41%. This is the percentage increase of flaring from 2012 to 2021. Gas flaring rose to 18 uh, BCM in 2021 from 13 BCM in 2012. BCM is billion cubic meters for those uh, who are not familiar with this. Gas flaring refers to the burning of natural gas associated with oil extraction instead of capturing and utilizing it. Now, the last figure, the figure before the last is 45 to 70 million cubic meters per day. These are the gas supplies federal Iraq is supposed to import annually from Iran. Iraq also relies on electricity imports from Iran. In 2021, Baghdad paid about $4 billion for these imports, and these are unstable supplies that can be suspended due to technical problems, late payments, or high gas demand inside Iran. The final figure, which sadly emerges when Iraq is struggling every year with acute power outages, especially during peak summer and winter months, is 37,000 megawatts. Federal Iraq's design power capacity is around 37,000 megawatts. Last summer, the government failed to produce more than 22,250 megawatts. Peak daily power demand was at around 36,000 megawatts. The group that always benefits from this gap between demand and supply is that network of politically connected private generators. Now, moving to slide three, please. <clears throat> The chart shows Iraq's primary energy consumption share by fuel type. It's unsurprising given Iraq's heavy reliance on fossil fuels and the low share of renewable sources as shown in the chart. Now I move to slide four to discuss Iraq's talk about energy transition. Iraq, uh, somebody needs to mute, please. Iraq can talk about its intentions to embrace renewable energy and reduce its reliance on fossil fuels, particularly when the country has become extremely vulnerable to climate change. This part is easy. For example, Baghdad has said it wants to reach around 33% of clean energy production by the end of this decade, with more than 6,000 megawatts originating from solar sources. That's extremely ambitious and easy to say. Baghdad can discuss various, Baghdad has discussed various uh, large scale PV power plant solar projects with different companies, including Saudi Aqua Power and French Total Energies. But there have been prolonged delays due to contractual disagreements, political paralysis, high cost of financing Iraqi projects, and other issues. The question is, does Iraq have the necessary regulatory framework or political capacity to carry out a successful and smooth renewable energy investment and embark on an energy transition? Several technical, legal, and economic challenges make this difficult and which I will summarize shortly. If Iraq does not take the serious actions to change how its energy sector operates, especially its power sector, 
And if it does not show that it is willing to focus more efforts to prepare the technical and legal ground for energy transition, it will be difficult to develop its skill base beyond the oil and gas sector. And I will come back to this before I finish the presentation. Slide five, please. Um, some key challenges to the energy transition in Iraq. We have lack of laws re re related to renewable energy investment, lack of emission laws and regulations, high costs of financing Iraqi projects, poor grid infrastructure, transmission and distribution losses. I would like to focus on five, four and five quickly. These two challenges can hardly be ignored when discussing the addition of thousands of megawatts of solar energy, for instance, in Iraq. The national grid has not been revamped technologically, and there are incredible technical and even non-technical losses. Six, high costs for replacing oil power fired power plants. The seven, the heavy focus on boosting crude oil production, thus relegating green energy as a matter of priority. Eight, the focus on increasing power generation without upgrading the power grid and the transmission and distribution systems. And I discussed these just now. Nine, poor revenue collection system. 10, lack of action to restructure the Ministry of Electricity. And finally, corruption. This is a severe problem for anyone who has worked on the ground in Baghdad and everyone knows that. Uh, finally, to slide six, uh, addressing some of the challenges to energy transition. Iraq needs to design a solid regulatory framework for energy transition. Without new regulations, Iraq will be putting the cart before the horse, and sadly, this is already happening. Uh, two, and this is an important measure, if the political will can be found somehow, Iraq needs to restructure the Ministry of Electricity because in its current form, it cannot succeed and will remain a burden on the state budget. Uh, former Iraqi Minister of Finance Ali Alawi warned in December 2021 of the possibility of Iraq's electricity sector destroying the state's budget within three to five years if it did not undergo the necessary reforms. Drawing attention to a lack of cost uh, recovery measures, Alawi said, quote unquote, Iraq's electricity sector is the only one of its kind in the world. Three, Iraq needs to seriously combat rampant corruption in the energy sector that has affected millions of lives and the work of some international companies. This is a severe problem. Four, Iraq needs to prioritize political stability and put an end to the revolving door in top leadership in the energy sector, because if ministers keep changing, and whenever a new one is sworn in, needs time to understand the status of the energy sector, how can progress be achieved then? If these key problems can be addressed, then the country will also be able to increase awareness campaigns to educate the Iraqi society about the benefits of using renewable technologies. It can also later manage to build skilled workforce and strong technical training facilities on renewable projects. But for now, all these don't exist. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nam. That's really interesting to get to detailed context in Iraq. And, I, and like other speakers, you've made a lot of connections between jobs and skills, but also wider economic and social development issues. And it's very interesting to see the intertwining of, the, of those issues. So thank you for that. Let's go now to Mohammed Shawali. Mohammed, thank you for joining us. Mohammed is the Renewable Energy and Environment Specialist at the Regional Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency. Mohammed, thanks. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Brown and Brian, for this introduction. Uh, as I said, this is Mohammed Shirwali from uh, Renewable Energy, Energy Efficiency uh, Center of Recurry. Uh, next slide, please. For those who doesn't know, Recurry, Recurry is an intergovernmental organization with 17 member states. Uh, and we also consider the technical arm of the League of Arab States uh, and uh, also, we are the first regional renewable, renewable energy and energy efficiency across the world. So, and our uh, headquarters are in Cairo, Egypt. Next slide, please. Uh, our member states uh, contain the whole uh, North Africa countries, besides to Jordan, Lebanon, Palestine, Iraq, Kuwait, Bahrain, and Yemen, Djibouti, and Somalia. Next slide, please. Uh, besides our aim, which is increase the adoption of renewable energy and energy efficiency practices uh, across the Arab countries, we are also working in many areas such as uh, private sector promotion, environment and climate change, and financial and economic assessment for uh, the membership countries, also to the capacity building programs related to energy, uh, renewable energy and energy efficiency. 
Next slide, next slide, please. So as we as we're here to talk about the skill uh, development uh, across the MENA region, uh, let me see uh, let me see this opportunity to introduce you the Pan Arab Certified Energy Management Professional Program or SIM. Uh, SIMP was established in 2016 uh, to fill the gap between the increasing demand for uh, high technical uh, skilled and certified personnel in the area in the Arab countries and lack of certified energy program so for from recognized body so also SIMP was designed to meet the requirement from the Arab countries as most of the Arab countries uh, force a regulation to uh, energy management sector uh, for the workers in that sector to be certified. So this uh, this is the idea, this is uh, the problem has been solved by SIM. So the impact was like uh, many impacts for the for the workers in, the, in, this, in this sector in the Arab countries, for example, lower increase in energy and demand and reducing investment and expanding in the supply side and most important thing, create a decent job for uh, locals there. Uh, next slide, please. Until now, uh, there, 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 there are four, uh, uh, 48 uh, round was held in four countries, and there is uh, there are 488 certified, which are uh, working in a decent job in industrial uh, and the energy management sector. So, uh, and also I would like to mention that there are many programs related to uh, youth and women environment in the, in the sector in local energy and energy efficiency. Uh, for example, we have uh, a program, our internship called Arab Program for Sustainable Energy Youth, uh, which has uh, been held for 10 years now or more to train the fresh graduates in uh, renewable energy projects. And there is a lot of uh, chemistry building program. There is no time to mention them all here. And, but I would like to, however, I would like to prefer and uh, to mention and emphasize on the same because it has its impact on the ground and uh, its impact is tangible for the workers in this sector. And next slide for this for uh, any contact information. And this is my email phone number. And thank you all. Thank you indeed, Mohammed. That was really interesting to hear. Uh, and I might ask you a question, if I may, because we're going to take, take a few questions now, as well as bring in some other uh, colleagues who are on the meeting with us today. So I invite any of you to put questions in the, in the Q&A chat. And Mohammed, just looking at the, the excellent work there on, on PA SEMP and, and the training across the region, is the regional transferability and mobility an important part of it? That if people are qualified in one country, they can they can then work in another country. Is is that an important part of the program? Uh, yes, as the program is certified from the Arab League state, which is contained the all Arab League. So yeah, if you uh, as soon as you got uh, certified, so you can work in any country which is within the League of Arab States. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And do you know whether people are availing of that opportunity, that, that people are using the qualification to to find work in different countries? Have, has that been something you've been able to track? Excuse me, I didn't hear you well. Could you so repeat do you know if people are making use of that kind of regional qualification, whether people are using the certification to, to transfer their skills to other countries? Uh, yeah, yeah. Actually, um, most of uh, participant or uh, certified uh, certified people who, who get the certificate from this program are working in industrial sector and and related to renewable energy or energy management so they yeah they are they uh, they exchange their uh, knowledge with the other people and under them as because as most of the certified people are in the managerial level so in a way or another they uh, they exchange the knowledge with their employee and we have a question in the chat, Mohammed, about how many people have been certified from P PSM. Yeah, 488 certified people, yeah. In four countries, uh, Egypt, Libya, Jordan, uh, and Palestine, and Egypt. And uh, we are doing an agreement with uh, Tunisia right now and uh, Algeria to do a round in, the, uh, in Tunis and Algeria. And during Corona, I would like to mention that during uh, COVID pandemic, we held uh, online training uh, 
rather than physically sessions. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mohammed. No, there's also a question in the chat for, for you, I think, about Iraq, asking about uh, how much small scale renewable development features in Iraq so far. Is that has a much been much focus on small scale renewables? Um, th thank you again. Um, with respect to the small scale, yes, there are. But again, uh, when it comes to, I mentioned something, raising awareness among people in order to embrace, you know, these technologies more. More work needs to be done. They do exist, but more can be done if there are more awareness campaigns to educate people about the importance uh, uh, of such, uh, you know, projects. Thank you, No. And Sean, if I could ask you a question, in fact, I, I have two, one from myself and one from the chat. But first of all, um, the question I was going to ask you, and it kind of dovetails uh, with the question that just popped up in the chat, was an interesting question, was uh, with these training programs, how, how much are they, how much is it different to be training people in, in clean energy skills versus any other kind of skills? Is this just, is it is it fairly similar kind of work, whether you happen to be focused on renewables or efficiency, or it could be lots of other opportunities? And it kind of relates to a question coming up in the chat as well, whether there is much focus on reskilling workers who are currently working in oil and gas and may transition into jobs in clean energy. Uh, so both good questions. Uh, maybe I'll start with the second one. It primarily focuses on rural women who weren't already working in the energy sector. So sort of training them on these income generating activities that they can now engage in based on having access to power. So it's mainly focused on that and the way that it sort of happens. There, there was another question in the chat saying, how is this focused on women? Um, basically uh, the assessment report sort of identifies what the needs are and these trainings are at sort of a very basic level uh, in terms of you know how to use these new energies uh, and how they can be used to generate income activities um, and sometimes the trainers are also women which makes it easier for some of these rural areas and things like that so it's I guess it's really really tailored to the audience so that it's not uh, so that's really relevant and and it's in conjunction with the stakeholders so what do they need they let us know and then we train on those income generating activities and what kinds of energies could be useful for that so sort of working backwards um and can you repeat your first question brian i'm not sure i answered that one i, I probably didn't ask it very well but it, i'm trying to ask you whether it, if if your training is focused on clean energy or, or if it happened to be focused on agriculture or I don't know, you know, car repair or whatever else. Does it, is it different to be work focusing on clean energy than any other set of skills? Yeah, I, it, that's a good question. It's it's a mix of both. So it's training on the clean energy technologies, and then also, you know, the the embroidery, um, the agricultural practices, and things like that. And it's kind of similar because it's first again conducting an assessment report, seeing what's needed, what kind of skills are lacking, who the audience is, and then tailoring the uh, trainings based on those types of things, uh, starting at a very basic level and hiring the appropriate consultants uh, based on the rural areas that can really uh, enhance what we're training because they're on the ground and they know what they're doing. So I wouldn't say it's very different, but we sort of have a holistic approach where we tackle both issues at the same time, the energy aspect and the income generating activities, just to make sure that these projects are sustainable uh, because they can actually fund themselves moving forward. And I presume it's not accidental that you're focused on not just any jobs and skills, but ones that, that enhance the well-being of the community more broadly by their existence. Yes, exactly. So they're jobs that were already sort of happening or there are new there are new jobs that were identified by the local people as things that would work. So it's not sort of inventing something new and, and pushing it on a local community. It's really a dialogue with them to see what's needed. And I think that's why we've witnessed so much success in our projects because specifically of that dialogue and that back and forth and sort of learning from the local people and, and how we can help them instead of just telling them what they need to do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sean. Rind, if I could ask you a question, because again, like others, you were emphasizing these are not just jobs, but they're about enhancing people's lives through energy access, productivity, and things like that. So when you're speaking to young people about clean energy and employment, do you find that this is a sector that's seen as attractive, that people want to make their careers in, or is it seen as just another job opportunity, if you like? Uh, I think there's a mix of both when it comes to, to the, you have the people that are already convinced and have values of sustainability and climate and, and clean energy. So these are people that go into the sector by conviction, but I've also seen a lot of 
graduates from my batch that weren't particularly passionate about climate, but since most of the new jobs in the energy sector are in clean energy, it's something that they went into after that. So it's a mix, it's a mix, it's a mix of, of both, but there is clearly an interest uh, for clean energy, but also, the frustration that most uh, most young people have in in the region in the MENA region is that so most curricula are quite traditional in the sense that they are uh, perhaps uh, very generic, like electrical engineering, chemical engineering, and then wh while that does prepare you to have a job, it does not specifically prepare you for the clean energy sector and then you have to have additional certifications or you have to go abroad to get a master's program that's relevant to what you want to specialize in so you see that okay so uh, what i've done in university is high level but it's still not enough it's still unrelated to the job that's lying ahead and then i have to go abroad and then i go abroad and then i see that if i go back i will be strictly in this applying uh, a sense of business sense of uh, approach to the market so if it's someone that's passionate about, about technology they're less interested in going back to their country because they feel like they will not contribute to the technology development so you do have this frustration about the gap between the education and the actual needs of the job market plus the limited contribution to technical development Thank you. That's very interesting. So, colleagues, we have a couple more questions coming in, and do please bring in your questions. But before we take those, I do want to bring in another couple of perspectives that that were kind. A couple of people were kind enough to join the discussion, and I, I would think we can hear from them now. And I'm going to start with with Khalid Salim Al Gamari. Khalid, thank you for joining us. Khalid is the Capability Building Stream Manager at the National Employment Program in Tashkil in Oman, and and. I know that you're doing some interesting work on skills uh, in clean energy in, in Oman. So we'd love to hear a bit from you, please. Thank you, Brian. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Thank you. OK, thank you for this opportunity, uh, Brian and uh, the team here. Uh, in fact, in National Employment Program, we're looking for the long term sustainable uh, solution to to reduce the unemployment uh, numbers, basically, and uh, here in Oman, uh, especially we got uh, hit by this uh, COVID uh, pandemic last two years, and then with the number of high number of graduates uh, joining the market, while low number of jobs is really a small community in Oman. So it's really a small number also making big difference, big difference comparing when you have small community as well. Uh, but the, the future is bright, I can say that, especially, I mean, maybe you heard yesterday, we just signed a few agreement for high green hydrogen, around 20, 20 billion US dollar for next seven years investment with different uh, international companies. And the good things here, uh, also for for uh, this uh, green energy or I, I can call it and also the way how we are tackling it especially with the learning we have from oil and gas so last uh, almost 50 years uh, now we want really to start early and uh, start early meaning even um, make that mindset when, in, for, in, uh, with the kids in the school and also in the university. And we want also this company uh, embracing or practicing the local content as we did it in oil and gas uh, 20, uh, 12 years ago. Uh, and starting from R&D, we don't just want to build the skills when the student or the graduates come to the job market. No, we want to start it where early when they are the colleges or schools and also think about the project and they start collaborate. And we want really to enhance the collaboration between the academia and the industry, especially in the clean energy. So that's one of the aspects we are really focusing on it. And also, as we speak, uh, Brian, last week and also a couple of weeks coming, we have a, a arranging a workshop with higher a Minister of Higher Education in Oman also want really to review 
the the scholarship the degrees we are sending the, our student internally or also externally and really to get big portion for the green energy as well as also mining also mining in oman is coming uh, uh, not coal mining no other mineral mining and many of them also used for the clean energy uh, so we want that one second things when it come to capability building most of the jobs coming in hydrogen and so in mining uh, the they are close to the type of jobs we have in the energy sector today in oil and gas, basically. Okay, but with the few changes or few modification or, or extra competency, we're going to give uh, our people. I'm not so really worried. I'm just shifting from people from oil and gas uh, to mining or or to uh, hydrogen or green hydrogen or other renewable energy because still we're going to have. A business, we're going to have a lot of work in oil and gas. Oil and gas, we still need it, and we're going to live with it uh, next. I mean, uh, the case. So, but the, the 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 investment in this green energy is really opportunity uh, for the youth in this country, and also around the surrounding country, and also the world as well, uh, to come and also to help us in this uh, in this uh, investment and also uh, producing the hydrogen and also other uh, type of energy so that's we're going to really uh, reduce the burden on the labor market and then we're going to expect a lot of jobs but at the same time uh, Brian we really we, we are starting as we speak now we are discussing with with ministry of uh, uh, energy to start uh, assigning some competency and see what type of competency needed in this type, different type of jobs, which is different than the oil and gas. So as you know, with this signature going on now, uh, this agreement is going to be some feed uh, projects the front end engineering projects and EMC project next, maybe around uh, two to five years. And then after that, we're going to see all commissioning of all these projects. And then that one, we need a huge number of people if coming from vocational education or, or other type of education. And hopefully at that time, we are also ready uh, with the competency that has mapped all the needs or the, all the skills need, uh, needed in this uh, new type of energy, uh, adapting worldwide best practice uh, from other company. And the good things, as I said, this agreement with really strong international companies, which is definitely they're going to also move their experience, practice also to, to our country. Thank you very much, Khalid. It's great to hear and congratulations on all of that work. Can I, can I ask you, how are jobs and careers in clean energy seen by people in Oman? Is this seen as an exciting new sector or is it just another sector? Is it seen as more or less attractive than oil and gas? How do people perceive the opportunities here? Uh, it's it's really, I, uh, I don't see it's like uh, they don't like it. In fact, uh, the good things, the mindset also in the kids in the, in the schools, they knew about this renewable. And they also, we started like, few years ago, we started already solar uh, plants and solar power. Also, we have wind in the country. Uh, the percentage is very low around, I can't really quote the number, it's around 5% uh, or, or more, or I mean, around that percent, we are generating uh, power from this uh, renewable energy. We have already youth, we have uh, Omanis working in this sector, and uh, also we have two universities, also open specialization or, or degrees in this renewable uh, energy or in the, in the country. And uh, the good things, they see it as a new opportunity for them in, uh, in, the, in the energy sector. Uh, we're going to employ a lot of people, especially, uh, uh, I mean, most of the jobs in this uh, energy, usually with really very good income. And that was also the mindset there. And definitely, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm seeing people really looking forward. Uh, especially the kids at university when we talk to them they are looking forward and they really they are uh, ready to start and by the way also i i saw enter pioneers already starting their small company in 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 uh, fixing solar panels and uh, doing doing auditing on on this uh, on this business as, as well 
So that's uh, also now small business for these people who started. And to be quite honest, Brian, with you also and the new things we are thinking about it and uh, maybe just um, I'm sharing some, maybe it's not secret, but I'm sharing you here. Uh, we also, we're going to plan with the big one of the big company looking after uh, the energy there. We're planning also incubators where we're going to, when you have the hydrogen, we're going to do some incubators for the small, small, uh, medium enterprises or, uh, or small companies, uh, local companies to really have something or, or build something or or get something which is going to help uh, or help in the green hydrogen industry or renewable industry. So that also we are really pushing or supporting the SMEs in next uh, five or 10 years. We're going to see that one as well. Because that's a big direction from the top uh, part in the government. Great, that's great to hear, Khalid. And again, congratulations. And Khalid, there's a question in the chat that I think you might be able to uh, comment on. You've talked about renewable energy and green hydrogen. Is energy efficiency also something you're looking at here? Uh, yes, uh, in fact, uh, Brian, I don't know if you heard or maybe some of the people in there, we have already net zero plan in 2050 and that we have already team under now uh, in the in, in government and that assigned with his majesty himself and then i i talked to uh, one of the member on the team uh, two days ago and really they have couple of initiative and projects already from pl planting which is uh, all the green planting and the small level and for the really de de uh, decarbonization, which is already started with the, one of the oil companies, which is the Petroleum Development of Oman. Uh, we already started that project, uh, CO2 injection, and also um, uh, uh, reducing the flaring. Already we started that mission and the flaring around more than 10 years ago to reduce also the flaring by 2030 to become very, I can't really quote the number now, but there's a lot of uh, initiative going on that uh, direction, uh, really to, come to the net zero by 2050 and that uh, group or that uh, uh, center it's really looking after from his majesty himself to make sure we are achieving that uh, objective by 2050. Thank you Khalid it's great to hear really it's really exciting work that's going on there thank you. Let's turn now to Morocco and we're, we're uh, fortunate to be joined by uh, Ms Khadija El Barnouni who's a specialist in environment and green economy at the Moroccan Agency for Energy Efficiency speaking of this topic. So Khadija we're very grateful that you uh, took time to join us and I'd like to give you the floor next please. Yes, can I share my screen? Yes please. Well, hi everyone. Uh, I would like to thank you first um, the International Ener Energy Agency for the for inviting us to this um, workshop to share with you the perspective of the Moroccan Agency uh, for um, Energy Efficiency. Um, in this field of skill development for the clean energy transition in Morocco. So at first, I would like to introduce the AME, the Moroccan Agency uh, for Energy Efficiency. Uh, it's a public institution under the supervision of um, the Minister of, Trans of Energy Transition and Sustainable uh, development created in 2016, whose mission is to implement the action of um, the action plans of the government's energy efficiency policy. Well, in Morocco, the energy trans transition is a national priority, uh, as said as the in the royal letter addressed in the internet in the national energy conference held on 2009. Um, as you can see, uh, we have some objectives. Sorry. 
um, I share with you here some objectives, some national objectives uh, to achieve in, two, um, in 2030. Uh, as in um, energy efficiency, we aim to get to 20% of uh, energy efficiency. And in renewable energy, uh, the country aims to achieve 52% uh, of um, installed power in renewable energy. So to get to this objective, the Moroccan Agency for Energy Efficiency has developed a green uh, catalog, uh, a green uh, training catalog uh, that has a lot of um, training sessions uh, in uh, energy efficiency. This uh, catalog uh, enabled to master the technologies related to energy uh, efficiency. Uh, I've shown you here some uh, of the training session included. Uh, and this presentation, I will develop four of them as eco-driving energy efficiency in buildings, solar pumping, and the green mask program that we have established. So I can start with uh, the training session that we uh, we offer for um, drivers in uh, from different ministries, managers and technicians. Uh, this program has been developed by the AMI. Um, that focus on the topic of eco driving and organize a train the trainer session. The this aim uh, of this training session was to install the principle of eco driving best practices for driver mode, as well as the techniques for commissioning, uh, using and configuring electric vehicle charging station and operating a vehicle eco driving simulator. So on solar pumping, pumping, sorry, AMI has carried out several capacity build buildings and training action for partners in order to create a conducive framework for the development of solar pumping system in the field of agriculture. We also uh, have, until today, have trained more than hundreds of uh, trainings uh, for managers, financial executive, professionals, farmers, partners. Uh, I would like to say that uh, we have a program named Pakapro for private uh, installer uh, for solar pumping uh, in the agriculture field. Well, uh, next, I have the training in uh, energy efficiency in buildings. Uh, we have organized several workshops on building energy, uh, buildings energy efficiency and thermal regulation, regulation. This training session were carried out in collaboration with the Ministry of National Territorial Planning, Urbanism, Housing and City Policy. The objective of this training is to popularize, sorry, is to popularize the, the content of the thermal regulation, regulation in question and to support the relevant actor and professionals to comply with the established requirements. So this training came following the publication of a decree which set, uh, which set out the documents required for application uh, for permits to subdivide and construct housing for development. And I would like to finish my presentation with the training in the scope of Green Mosque program. Uh, it's a program that aims to upgrade the energy efficiency of mosques through the implementation of energy efficiency techniques and also uh, developing training awareness rising for religious actor. This program was uh, carried out with the Ministry of Habus and Islamic Affairs. Uh, this training focus on the energy efficiency solution identified as a priority, such as the, in the installation of photovoltaic system, solar thermal system, and the replacement of internal lightning system and electric panel. This program uh, had more than uh, 1,400 beneficiaries in Morocco. And thank you for your attention. 
Thank you very much, Khadija. It's really interesting to hear the range of programs that, that are, are going on there. Can I ask you just to maybe comment on, let's say, their popularity or their attractiveness? Are these are these programs that a lot of people want to participate in, or do you have to encourage people to participate? Uh, how does that work? Um, we uh, for like solar pumping, uh, the program Takab had uh, had been very uh, had a good. Um, as I said, uh, it was very popular because it's um, uh, it can give uh, in private installer uh, the, with getting this this time of uh, this this type of training uh, the 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 uh, their client trust them uh, with the, their installation and uh, for other. Um, for other uh, programs, uh, we carry out uh, some, I say, uh, we promote through our uh, website, but all in all, we we get very, uh, we would, uh, especially the, the uh, uh, our programs are, um, uh the our programs will, will uh, they they knew uh, they are very popular and uh, we don't we don't really at first when we first launched our green uh, catalog we had to uh, to to uh, promote it a little bit but uh, later it's uh, the train the, the training session were uh, were a good hit that's great to hear. Thank you. So, colleagues, before I return to some uh, questions from our participants, I'd like to bring in one one other voice, which I think is a very important one to hear, and that's Bradley Hiller, who's the lead climate change specialist at the Islamic Development Bank. Bradley, we'd love to hear your perspective on these issues, please. Yeah, thank you, Brian. Thank you, colleagues. It's been very interesting to listen to all the different perspectives today. It's been very rich. Um, so, for those who don't know, Islamic Development Bank is a multilateral development bank. Uh, we have 57 member countries, um, many of which are in the MENA region, so uh, very topical for today. Um, and I think uh, one, one aspect of that which is, uh, gives us a unique perspective is this sort of regional um, perspective with different countries. Um, as you probably know with development banks, the core focus traditionally has been on poverty alleviation. This is still very much part of our core business. Um, we do this through financing, through knowledge generation, capacity building and technical assistance. But also um, by the end of 2023, the Islamic Development Bank is committed to be Paris aligned um, with its sovereign operations. Um, and as, as many people probably know, um, just transition is referenced specifically in the Paris Agreement. So this is sort of all where um, some of this work kicks off for us. Uh, in terms of energy, we do have an energy policy which is built around four pillars. Um, energy access is a big issue uh, in many of our um, countries. But then we also look at renewable energy, energy efficiency, and then knowledge generation and transfer. In terms of enabling factors um, for the energy policy, we do um, try to promote private sector activity, also innovative financing, which I think can be important in especially in new uh, areas or, or um, of business. Uh, also regional integration, I spoke about that just briefly. And then also partnerships working with groups such as uh, International Energy Agency and others um, to address some of these challenges. So uh, more specifically on the skills development side of things, um, I thought I'd introduce a bit of a different perspective. Um, we've talked a lot about skills development of um, sort of individuals and people working perhaps in the private sector or sort of at the community level, which is obviously very important, but also there's the element of skills development or capacity building of governments themselves. Um, and I think this is quite a key issue around energy transition. And why is this so? Um, firstly, I think uh, what we're starting to look at is um, country industrial policy. So this relates to policies around manufacturing, labour and these types of things. Um, so how do we have the government um, promote uh, a transition to a green economy, perhaps through some of these policies at national level, I think is important. And then obviously this then links to other um, national level policies such as NDCs, which are nationally determined contributions. Um, and then also more recently, what they call long-term strategies, which are countries looking at um, long-term issues related to things such as just transition around labor policies as well. So I think this is quite important. 
then when we come to um, skills development uh, for individuals, uh, often capacity building is, is a strong, and knowledge exchange and generation is a strong element of our project investments. Uh, but then we also do have um, specific mechanisms. We have something called a reverse linkage mechanism, which encourages exchange of information between countries. Um, and this is quite a powerful tool as well. So if we see success in one country, perhaps around a, a industrial policy or a particular clean energy um, policy with uh, good labor conditions and um, a green transition, then we can uh, help share that between institutions, between different countries. Um, so I think this is also quite interesting as well. And then finally, uh, before I finish up, um, recently at the COP27 um, in Egypt, um, we did look at a green, a, a youth green skills accelerator program or a, a competition um, where we do see um, many youth, uh, as have been discussed uh, from colleagues in Iraq and others, um, around the youth engaging in these sorts of activities, particularly around decentralized systems where they can be installed perhaps with lower upfront capital costs, but then operation maintenance um, can be skill development for, for local people and, and to run enterprises off this. So I'll stop there, uh, just gives a bit of a, uh, a perspective of some of the things that we're looking at, but very uh, supportive and we're, we're increasing and learning like everybody else around just transition. Um, and it's something as, as an MDB or multilateral development bank community that we're trying to um, uh, skill up on and um, enhance our support. Uh, both internally with our colleagues, but also with our member countries. So thank you very much, Brian, and um, look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you, Bradley. Really interesting to hear, and thank you for that. And let me just ask you a couple of quick questions. First of all, um, how much do you, the kind of work that you do, is it, how much is it country specific, region specific? Is it transferable across MENA? Is it transferable globally? Do you see that programs have to be tailored for each local circumstance, or they're quite, they're quite generalizable? Yeah, so uh, as I said, we do have the capacity to work at both scales. I think regionally, often it is um, sometimes knowledge products and generation. So trying to learn if there's common challenges, perhaps that a region could face. And then, you know, by, by um, continuation there, you know, common solutions. Um, we are looking at one project, which is an example where we're looking at um, sort of regional energy coupling. Um, so, you know, can you, try to find some um, benefits of perhaps energy being generated in one country and then you know reliable demand or buyer um, within the region. So I think this is this is good, especially for large scale um, you know clean energy projects. Um, so I think in that sense there can be some transferable learning. I think also you know depending on the specific challenges that um, regions face, we are quite unique because we do cover um, South America, Africa, Middle East, uh, and North Africa, Central Asia, and a little bit in Southeast Asia. So we can bring examples if there's been success in one region that we think is transferable, we could bring that to others. But generally what we do is respond to requests from countries themselves, and often they chart their own development pathways. So more commonly, we do tend to work with individual countries, and we have what we call membership country partnership strategies, which are agreements between the bank and also the country on how they may want support looking forward to say the next three or four years. So it's a combination of both, but um, more strongly with investments, it's usually um, on a country uh, country level. Thank you. And there's a question in the chat about scalableness because some of the programs we're hearing about today and, and we know are going on are still relatively small or relatively new or whatever else. What's your view on scalability? Can, they, can all of these programs grow or, or, or are they constrained by size or what do you think? Yeah, it's a good question. I think, to, to be honest, the, the multilateral development banks, and when I talk about this, people might be familiar with the World Bank or the African Development Bank and other groups. These are examples of multilateral development banks. I think um, some, and I'm not a banker myself, I'm actually an engineer and scientist, but I think from a banking perspective, often um, traditionally it's been easier to do larger scale investments with less transactions um, than many, many transactions of, of lower value um, investments. And I, I think that's been a model that um, does work for large scale infrastructure. Um, but if you're starting to look at decentralized systems, um, this is, I think, where you need to aggregate sometimes some of these models. You do it at a regional scale, for example, in a, sorry, when I say regional, say provincial within a country, or perhaps even regional between countries, 
um, where you can get that scale of investment uh, for, for development banks to intervene. But also increasingly, um, business models are emerging where, um, as I mentioned, one of our energy sector policy enablers is looking at innovative financing. And this may be um, you know, co-financing or blended financing, we call it, um, with perhaps private sector partners where there is opportunity to either scale decentralized systems or still look at some of the large infrastructure, which may be associated with um, say green hydrogen and other um, elements that are being considered. Thank you, Bradley. Let me ask a question that anybody may want to take uh, to, if it's something you, you know about, which is about bioenergy. Cause we had a question in the chat saying we've heard about solar and renewables and efficiency and hydrogen. Uh, we haven't heard so much about, about skills in bioenergy. Has, any, has anybody working in this area would like to comment on it? Uh, Brian? Khalid, please, yeah. Uh, we have uh, some initiative, I think I uh, heard about one or two projects here in Oman with the uh, interpioneer starting from university, really from the date seats, and uh, they're already producing uh, oil from it, but it's really from bioenergy. But how is it scalable? It's very small. Uh, is it commercialized? It's not yet. Uh, as far as I know, it's just, uh, it's very small scale, but it's really some work going on. And also there's another project also I heard, also a student uh, project with their uh, professors basically in the universities. But it's not really at a commercial level, uh, at least in Oman, as, I, I, as far as I know. Thank you very much, Kelly. That's good to hear. And Faiza, if I could ask you a quick question, because I know you've had some connection difficulties, but I hope you're with us now. Because we had a little discussion a minute ago, I, I'm not sure if you, if you heard it, uh, on scalability. And, and obviously, we heard about the really excellent programs you're doing. I'd love to ask you about, uh, do you have plans to scale them up? Is it possible to scale them up? Is it just a question of financing? What, what are your plans about, about getting bigger? Well, actually, most of the, our projects have a sustainability plan as to complete them. Uh, in fact, we have the pilot in uh, Aqaba now. We are planning the sustainability plan with ASISA, which is um, the main authority there, uh, to build and to uh, contribute more on, uh, uh, on their job as, um, I mean, uh, the needs job, to be, to be exact, as to sustain the project. Thank you. That's really interesting to hear. Thank you. There's a question here that I think my colleague Bruno is probably the best place to answer. Bruno, there's a question here about the nature of the skills we see as most needed in clean energy transitions. And particularly, is it all about skilled workers or are there also jobs for, for less skilled workers? What are your thoughts on that? Thanks. Uh, yeah, I think it's a very important question. And, you know, like we need to keep in mind that we've been talking about, you know, like skills development and skill needs really since the offset of the industrial revolution. And uh, it is not so much that jobs get created or destroyed, it's that they change. So I think what we would need is, you know, like forward looking policies, industrial policies from the government. And, you know, like we can argue on the level of ambition and whatnot. But if you look at, you know, like EU 455, sorry, uh, Repower EU, the IRA now, they said, you know, like they give visibility, first of all, to academia to be able to tailor their curriculums, but also, you know, like on the other hand, to, you know, like investments and, and, and 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 companies to be able to you know like to have a project pipeline based on that industrial policy, and you know it was great to hear from Mohammed that you know like the these certificates work across the Arab League and that you know like the students can move, but it is also important to keep in mind that those industrial policies will be very different across the regions. Like some of them will have a focus more in low-income countries, might be sustainable development. In richer countries, might be the diversification of their economies. Um, so I think the focus is, you know, like something that's been mentioned here a lot, which is for workers to be able to also move and for those skills to be able to be transferable across the region and have some kind of a standard of education. And yeah, there will be opportunities, you know, like for both high skill, lower, uh, mid skill. It's also a very important part of the of um, of the mix. But as I said, I think we need that that forward looking policy that can then have training bodies, universities whatever training center you have to be able to tailor their offers based on that particular policy that the governments are pushing forward. Thanks. Thank you, Bruno. Very interesting. So colleagues and friends, we're almost out of time. We've had a great uh, discussion. Really... Please, Khadija, of course.
I just want to say that in Morocco, we have developed a roadmap for biomass energy use, aiming at the sustainable use of biomass as a renewable, re renewable and climate-friendly source of energy. Uh, this, uh, this roadmap developed uh, an action plan to optimize energy recovery by 2013. In, uh, and it presents also the potential for the agriculture, for sea waste and wastewater sectors uh, to uh, achieve the, the goal in this uh, field. That's great to hear. Thank you. And it shows the wide range of programs you're working on, Khadija. Thank you very much. So, colleagues, before we close, I'd like to return to my colleague, Nadim, for reflections on what he's heard and any, any remarks you'd like to add before we finish. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. So, no, uh, thank you, Brian, and thank you for, for people in the panel. I think it was great to have your insights. Uh, again, we can see that we hear very uh, interesting steps taken at the regional level, but we that discussion was also the opportunity to shed the light on some of the key challenges. Um, here, again, uh, at the IEA, but other uh, partners that we have globally, we can uh, we can see that the region can be very roughly divided into producers and hydrocarbon importers, which have very different challenges. Uh, while producer economies are looking into uh, economic diversification, uh, and it was great to have the views from uh, Mr. El Ghamari earlier, and I wanted to use the opportunity to to um, to um, discuss about a, a a report that we are developing with the government of Oman uh, that's looking into um, their uh, plans for diversification, especially in industries such as uh, low emissions hydrogen. Um, so in Oman, there's been there's a very um, um, acute look that's being given at the opportunity cost of shifting from. Uh, um, oil and gas generated revenues to uh, revenues from clean energy um, industries. And, and um, here it's on the skills level, they're also very interested to understand the linkages between the oil and gas industry and, uh, and the, for example, a potential low emissions hydrogen industry. You can see that there's a lot of um, commonalities and linkages, but there's also some jobs that will require some reskilling. Uh, but again, as uh, Rind mentioned earlier, we see a ramp up of decentralized PV generation in the region, especially for hydrocarbon importers. So a very different set of challenges. And that we can see that across the regions, you have some acute cases like Lebanon or Iraq that are suffering uh, supply shor shortages. But again, this calls for another set of, re of, of regulatory measures for this to be able to take place in a more fair and equitable way. Because as of today, this is mainly benefiting the, let's say, higher end of the uh, revenues or the of the households in 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 the countries in these countries so but to to sum up all of that together and regardless of whether you're a hydrocarbon importer or a producer economy having as uh, my colleague bruno said but that also was also emphasized by our colleague from the uh, isdv uh, bradley um the need for an industrial policy to have a long term um, objective for these countries, uh, whatever form it takes, is key to ensuring that you know we can have skills and and um, and labor policies that are underpinning uh, the development of uh, you know clean energy technologies in the region. And uh, that would be mainly how I would like to conclude it. And I'll I'll pass it on again to Brian for for a few last words of wisdom. Thank you. Well, thank you, Nadim. I don't know about words of wisdom, but there'll be words of thanks because I'm really grateful for everybody who spoke today. We, I certainly, I've learned a lot from all of you, and it's really exciting to hear the great work we're all doing across the region. And, and so, thank you very much for joining us, and thanks everybody who joined and participated in today's event. And let me just record also my thanks for my colleagues Matthew and Josh who who uh, organised today's event and ran it so well. I'm, I'm very grateful to them too. And as you know, this is one of an ongoing series of webinars the IEA is holding on what we call people 
people centered themes around clean energy transitions relating to inclusion, jobs, skills, social benefits. Uh, so we're very keen to stay in touch with you as we expand our work in this area. You've heard about some of the work we're doing from Nadim. We're doing further work on job skills, many related questions. Always very keen to hear from you in terms of what you're doing, what your successes and challenges are, and how we can work with you all on these very important issues. So thanks again for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you very soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.